Okay, I think we're ready to get started. Um, welcome, I'm Andrea Woody. I am the chair of the philosophy department and uh, I'll sort of be the ringleader for uh, today's event. Uh, the department award ceremony is something that the department does every spring in order to recognize uh, the many excellent students uh, that we have uh, in the department and across the university. I want to, before we even get started, offer thanks uh, to the people who have made today's event possible. And that in particular is the excellent staff in the philosophy department. So Kate Golden, who is our development coordinator, is the person in charge of this uh, wonderful presentation that you're going, uh, you're going to see this afternoon. Gina Gould is the undergraduate advisor. She's waving at us. Uh, Gina is uh, instrumental to keeping the undergraduate program uh, running and helping undergraduates uh, progress through the degree. We absolutely couldn't do it without Gina. Uh, Chris Dawson Ripley is the uh, administrator in the department. And essentially, uh, Chris ends up doing anything that needs to be done. Uh, this year in particular, we've had some, uh, some absences. We've had cases where there have been staff uh, missing. And so Chris has uh, covered every base that needed to be uh, covered and really kept the boat floating. Um, and he will also help be running the meeting today. And then Kristen Colgard, who we'd like to uh, uh, welcome to the department, who has just joined us in the past few weeks. And uh, we are looking forward to her being our new graduate advisor. So um, the staff really make this event possible. I couldn't do it without them. Uh, they always have my back uh, and I thank them so much. So um, in a year like the year we've just had, I think we need events like this more than ever. The department award ceremony is one of my favorite events of the year um, because uh, it really is the epitome of a feel good event. We have so many wonderful people in this community and this gives us an opportunity to celebrate uh, many of the wonderful things that happen over the course of a year and really focus on our students who are the lifeblood of the department. So essentially here's how things are going to work. We have a whole uh, 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 set of people that we would like to acknowledge. And in each case, I will give a short description uh, of an award uh, and tell us who the recipient is for this year. Then we will have a member of the community, either a faculty member or a graduate student who will speak uh, about that person. Uh, after that, what I'd like to do is ask the recipient uh, to unmute themselves and say, thank you, or how are you guys doing? Whatever you wanna say, because that means your face will pop up on the screen so that people can see you uh, and be able to clap while we can, uh, we can see you in person. And then we'll move on uh, to the next one. So, um, so here we go, let's get started. I'm going to start uh, with the undergraduate awards. Now our department draws outstanding undergraduate students from across the university. Once a year, we gather to celebrate the best of the best. Student whose hard work, creativity, and accomplishments in philosophy are especially worthy of recognition. Our first three awards are made possible by generous contributions to the Friends of Philosophy Fund. And I express my appreciation to all the individuals who have contributed. The Outstanding Undergraduate Scholar Award acknowledges outstanding academic merit expressed primarily through coursework, but also other contributions to the department in a continuing student at any stage of their studies. This year's recipient is Aaron Rosser. And speaking for Aaron will be Anthony Fisher. Uh, thanks, Andrea. So uh, Aaron Rosser, I got to, I've gotten to know him quite well over the last uh, couple of years. Back in the day when things were quite different, I remember him sitting up the back and kind of a little to the right, or at least to my right. And um, since moving to Zoom, he's become uh, front and center. And in both contexts, he's been quick off the mark with the topic of the day and clearly thought hard about the material that we've um, uh, sort of examining. I remember um, 
quite vividly here in um, the metaphysics course that he took with me. Um, now, metaphysics is quite fun and wild, but it can get very hard very quickly. And uh, thinking about far out things like essences and possible worlds and the nature of space and time, they uh, come with some regimentation. And Aaron was not deterred uh, by this at all, not, not one bit, and talked to it very, very well. And I remember his paper on the, the nature of time and our experience of the passage of time. And one thing that sort of stood out for me with this uh, paper was that he brought together his, his views, his own views that he developed over a number of courses that he took with me, bringing um, his ideas uh, from reading David Hume to the uh, question about the nature of time and our experience of the passage of time. And I thought that showed great intellectual breadth and depth. So just to sort of sum up, uh, I think he's quite deserving of the Outstanding Scholar Award. Congratulations, Aaron. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Um, I, I've, I've had such a great time in this department and uh, yeah, once again, thank you guys so much for all of the, the wonderful classes that I've been, uh, been able to take here. Great, we look forward to seeing you in more classes going forward. The Outstanding Graduating Senior Major Award acknowledges outstanding academic merit, again expressed primarily through coursework, but also other contributions to the department in a graduating senior philosophy major. This year, we have two recipients, Jared Graham and Kelsey Kenoshita. Speaking for Jared will be Karina Fouri. Thank you very much, Andrea. So I got to know Jared in my philosophy of feminism course, and he stands out in many ways for his excellent communication skills, for his originality, which is something I think um, I don't often get from undergraduates and really stood out for me. Um, his exceptionally clear writing style, the depth of his philosophical knowledge, um, but I have to admit that one of the things that I will remember him the most for is that he wrote one of his essays for my class on the big Lebowski and patriarchy. And um, it's not often that a thoughtful and original philosophical argument can be so entertaining, but indeed it was. And for those of you who don't know the movie, it's a farcical comedy, a lot of dark humor, and a scene that can help you to understand why good philosophy and the Big Lebowski are not typically going to be thought of to go together. Imagine a middle-aged man with straggling long hair and beard wearing a dressing gown and sunglasses in a supermarket and opening and sipping from a carton he has just taken from the shelf. That's one of the opening scenes and that is the main character. Um, oh, and his nickname is The Dude, right? So unlikely as it is, Jared did an analysis of this film that made what I think is a profound philosophical point and one that is often neglected. And that is that patriarchal norms have the potential to harm everyone in society, even men, and even what we might want to refer to as bystanders in terms of their moral involvement. I don't want to trivialize Jared's contribution to the class by reducing it to a clever analysis of a film, though. Jared wrote three papers for this class, the two being an exposition of um, Elisa Bieria's take on agency and oppression, and also a sympathetic re revision of Christy Dotson's argument that philosophy requires a culture of praxis in order to respect diverse philosophers. In both of these papers, Jared demonstrated his exceptional writing and argumentation skills, while also showing a marked sensitivity towards the subject matter, right? And the subject matter has to do with the real life oppression of women and people of color. Um, Jared has also honed skills of discussing philosophy in ways that I'm actually jealous of and I can learn a lot from. In class discussions, he's able to assert his views clearly, precisely, and confidently, while at the same time, and this is the tricky balance to maintain, not dominating the conversation, really listening actively to others and being so respectful of their views. And I think that combination of actually being able to express yourself well, precisely, confidently, but not stepping on other people's toes is so hard to balance. Jared is an 
exceptional philosopher and he is absolutely an outstanding graduating senior. Thank you. Wow, thank you. I did not expect, I'll admit, to have that Big Lebowski paper ever come back up. Um, but I'm really glad you enjoyed it. Thank you so much. And thank you also to the department. Uh, this is a really special and wonderful place and I'm sad to see it go. Congratulations, Jared. Our other recipient is Kelsey Kenoshita and speaking for Kelsey is Amelia Wirtz. Thank you. So I had the pleasure of having Kelsey in my very first class that I ever taught at the University of Washington which was this last autumn. And it was also the first ever online course that I ever taught. So um, I will say it was very, I was extremely lucky to have Kelsey in this class because Kelsey, um, she does a lot of things really brilliantly, but among them are, uh, one of the most uh, things that I valued most about Kelsey was her ability to really engage in discussion, even in Zoom, even in Zoom land time. And uh, she was able to read these really complicated texts. We were reading um, all kinds of things about the metaphysical nature of law. And, you know, uh, sometimes we're reading Aquinas and these sort of archaic texts. And they're full of, of course, life philosophy as all these little tiny nuanced arguments. And they can just honestly be really hard to follow. But what's more is like, they can actually just be a little bit hard to understand. What is the point of making all of these little tiny ridiculous nuanced arguments about law, about something that's so practical and affects people's lives. And the thing that I loved about Kelsey is that she was able to follow the really complicated nuanced arguments, which is already like extremely difficult, but she also really quickly was able to see the salience of these little tiny nuanced arguments for, for what that meant for things like, um, for things like civil disobedience, um, for things like how we ought to criticize unjust laws and all kinds of things like that. And it was extremely impressive to see that pretty quickly she could translate these abstract, um, sometimes even extremely old arguments about the nature of law into really concrete uh, concrete responses to even the things that are going on in the world right now. So I really appreciated her ability to do that. And she also was able to do that in conversation with her classmates in a way that invited more conversation rather than shutting conversation down and that really um, helped create a community in our in our little Zoom classroom, which I was extremely lucky to have because it was a, it was tough to start off uh, start off my class that uh, that way in Zoom. So I really appreciated Kelsey's um, presence in the class, and I could also go on and on about the final paper that you wrote. It was really a pleasure to read, um, but I won't I won't take a, up a ton of time explaining her nuanced take on radical feminism versus liberal feminism. Uh, but it was a it was a true pleasure to have her in my class, and I count myself as quite lucky that um, my very first class at the UW uh, in, in included Kelsey. So thank you, Kelsey, and congratulations. Thanks, Amelia, and thank you, everybody else. I see a lot of familiar faces, and I'm gonna miss working and learning from everybody. So thanks again. Congratulations, Kelsey. Our doctoral students do a tremendous amount of teaching and because they lead many of the discussion sections that are an essential component of our courses, they get to know our undergraduate students very well. The Graduate Student Choice Award provides our graduate students an opportunity to undergraduate whose excellence in the classroom they have witnessed firsthand. This year's recipient is Alice Shing and speaking for Alice will be Anna Bates. Thank you, Andrea. Um, uh, Alice was my student in two classes this year and two very different classes. One was the philosophy to, of persuasion and the other was intro to logic. And in both classes, they stood out for being just exceptionally hardworking and really thoughtful. Um, I was always so impressed with her engagement with the text, it felt like Every time we would get together to talk about the text, she always had managed to zoom in on like the one really key question to ask or like the one really good objection to make to the argument. And I just thought that was amazing. Um, if 
but honestly what stands out the most is that she is just a really lovely person um, inside the classroom and in office hours. Um, she's so friendly um, and she would come by my office hours nearly every week just because she was excited to keep learning about philosophy. And uh, um, that was an especially great boon during a year when it was pretty hard to connect with students and know if um, anyone was enjoying learning about philosophy. Um, she's also very kind. And um, even when she was um, pointing out my typos on um, handouts or on homeworks, uh, she always did so very politely, which I appreciated. Um, I hope she takes some more philosophy classes and I hope that I can eventually meet her in person. Uh, thank you very much for that, Anna. Oh, camera. Okay. Um, and thank you to everyone else as well. The philosophy classes have been super fun and I'm looking forward to meeting everyone in person. Congratulations, Alice. Yes, we look forward to seeing you in the halls of savory. The Kenneth C. Clatterbaugh Endowed Scholarship in Philosophy was established to honor and recognize the substantial contributions to both the department and the university of an outstanding faculty member, Ken Clatterbaugh. Ken served as chair of the philosophy department for 15 years from 1996 to 2011. He had a deep and abiding commitment to undergraduate education. The scholarship that bears his name acknowledges a student with financial need who displays outstanding academic merit and an enduring commitment to philosophy. This year, the recipient is Bryce Larson and speaking for Bryce is Connor Mayo Wilson. Okay, so when I was asked to speak on Bryce's behalf, I thought that this was sort of a, uh, a no brainer. Bryce, um, I thought of three points that, that um, uh, I would try to summarize Bryce by. The first is that he reminds me a lot of Brian Skirms in that he says precisely what is necessary to make a philosophical point and then no more. Um, besides that being very impressed with his brevity and precision, um, I also found it lovely as someone who had to grade his work because I just looked, it was correct and accurate and concise all the time and then I couldn't move on. Um, so thank you, Bryce. That's the first way you've made, you know, at least um, this instructor's uh, life a lot easier. Um, the second thing I want to say is, is that towards the end of the quarter, I started to see Bryce um, in our most recent class in uh, Induction and Probability he uh, started to do some really creative stuff too. So his final paper, which discussed whether or not fishery and testing could justify you know, the types of um, beliefs that we make in science on the basis of standard statistical testing, um, really did illustrate a pretty um, refined understanding of certain experimental designs of what probability is supposed to do, how probability is supposed to link up to a particular um, epistemological theories of justified belief and so on. And it was that creativity, I think, in the, in the last little bit that, that made me think, oh, okay, well, you know, I felt better as an instructor, I thought. At least, you know, in, in the middle of the Zoom pandemic, sometimes you need to see that one of your students is really thriving in order to not, you know, feel like you're talking to, to, the, to the void. And so I really appreciated that um, and thought Bryce was very impressive that way. The third thing I want to say is, in addition to his um, academic and intellectual feats, precision, which I'm not exhibiting right now, um, and creativity in, in his second, uh, in his final paper for the class, Bryce also has a certain type of interpersonal skill of telling people that you screwed up a little bit without being a jerk about it. And this, I thought, was also very great. So at one point, Bryce hadn't completed um, an exercise on a problem set. I said, Bryce, you can redo it because, right, he said he had written on the problem set, I couldn't find the instructions for how to complete a problem of this type. And the reason that he had done this is because the only instructions available were an obscure handout that I had created and forgotten to, you know, 
let students know to look at it. So Bryce was very nicely pointing out to me, maybe he didn't intend it this way, um, but this is one of the ways that I thought, oh, this is a way I can do my job better. Um, and I, um, you know, the ability to communicate to someone that, you know, their instructions or, uh, or assignments could be a little bit clearer, um, uh, I think is a, is a wonderful task for a person to have to basically say to the instructor, you can do your job a little bit better, but not be a jerk about it. So I appreciate Bryce for creativity, precision, and, and, and uh, you know, just being an all around good student. Okay, I'll stop. Congrats, Bryce. Thank you. You're too kind. Ah, uh, Bryce, you're you're true to form. I see. Congratulations. <laughs> so the Thomas Hankins Essay Prize in History and Philosophy of Science recognizes the best essay on a topic in the history and philosophy of science written in the past year and submitted to the award committee, which is composed of faculty uh, specializing in these fields. This prize was established through generous support from the Robinson family in honor of Thomas Hankins, a renowned historian of science and cherished UW faculty member for many years. This year's recipient of the Hankins Prize for an essay titled Development of Statistics During the 19th Century is Townsend Rowland. I know that Bruce Hevely was hoping to speak for Townsend. Bruce, are you here? I don't think I see Bruce. Okay, I think we will have to uh, move to our backup plan, Connor Mayo Wilson. Um, Bruce is um, uh, Bruce is on call right now as an emergency EMT, and so we always knew there was a possibility that he might not be able uh, to join us. So, uh, so Connor, I'll pass to you. Sure. Uh, let me say one thing before I, I describe the virtues of the paper about Townsend. So Townsend told me earlier this year um, that his first two classes at the University of Washington um, were Bruce Heavily's history of science class followed by my introduction to symbolic logic class. So I think it's really nice and fitting that towards the end of his time at the University of Washington, he's winning prizes for doing work in history of science. Um, you know, I think that's a, a, a really great trajectory from intro symbolic logic to, you know, writing papers on the history of 19th century statistics. Um, what Townsend does in this really nice, uh, paper is he takes issue with a claim made by Ted Porter um, in a book on the development of statistical thinking, mostly through the, the, the 19th century. And Townsend basically says that this claim, which is something along the lines of the history of 19th century statistics is coextensive with the history of the reinterpretation of the Gaussian distribution. And he basically takes Porter to task for this. Now, what I think is really interesting about this criticism um, and what's remarkable about this is that, first of all, if you read Townsend's paper, beside he's capable of describing rather technical things in very simple, clear language throughout. This is complicated stuff, and it's you know not easy to describe in um, clear prose, but Townsend mean, manages to do it throughout the entire time. But he also draws on a number of different themes very cogently discussing, for instance, you know, why is Porter's claim over the top? Well, there are all of these other statistical techniques, in particular least squares and um, correlation that are being developed for the 19th century that don't on the immediate surface have to do with normal distribution. So there's some technical stuff there, but that's also supported with his claims about, you know, why these developments were taking place during the 19th century. So Townsend relates this seemingly mathematical technical stuff to discussions of colonialism and empire, right, in 19th century Europe. And if you don't see the relationship between statistics and those things, right, um, I'd recommend emailing Townsend and asking him for a copy of this paper because he um, illustrates the relationship between them rather marvelously. So congratulations, Townsend, you know, um, not surprising at all um, to see you up here, you know, after all of your hard work over the last so many years. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to see you win this prize. 
Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate the kind words. I want to give a special thank you to Professor Mayo Wilson and Professor Heavily, who's not here. So hopefully this uh, reaches him at whatever firefighting site he's at. Um, that uh, I couldn't have done it without both of your guidance. And I also want to thank um, the rest of the philosophy department um, because I've taken courses and talked to many of you. Um, and all of all of it is sort of instrumental in my learning and I really appreciate it. So thank you. Congratulations, Townsend. And uh, I know that Bruce is, uh, is sorry that he wasn't able to be here with us because he really did want to be here. Um, I will also say, because I am pretty sure that at least uh, one of the people connected to the Robinson Family uh, Fund that uh, is connected to this prize is in our audience. And yes, indeed, the, uh, the paper is coming your way. Townsend has said you can read it. So we'll keep the circle going. On to our next award, the Kenneth R. Parker Award for Excellence in Community Service honors a student who blends the study of philosophy with a volunteer-based community project. The award isn't solely about volunteering. Applicants are asked to reflect on how the study of philosophy informed or enriched their volunteer experiences. This year's recipient is Nathan Hahn. Nathan, who is a double major in philosophy and aeronautics and astronautics, is being recognized for his work with the Asian Alliance for Mental Health a student-led organization here on campus. Building on personal experience, Nathan has stepped into a leadership role in this organization, recruiting most of the rest of the leadership team after many previous students graduated and extending the reach of the organization's impact in part by expanding the Alliance's community outreach and social media. Lindo Anno, the advisor for AAMH, could not be with us here today, but sent the following words. Nathan's leadership and compassion to help support mental health and wellness for Asian American students and communities is greatly appreciated. The collective efforts to break down the stigma surrounding mental health for Asian Americans and other people of color communities is critical and student to student support is highly effective. I'd like to read uh, a a brief excerpt from Han's application essay. Nathan said, when I look back to the four years I was at the University of Washington, I believe the most impactful and rewarding time I spent was with the Asian Alliance. The skills that I cultivated from my philosophy classes, be it listening, formulating an argument, or facilitating a meeting, proved to me that philosophy isn't simply an abstract endeavor filled with theoretical musings. Instead, it can be utilized in a meaningful and tangible way to improve others' lives. Philosophy empowered me to overcome my insecurities in leading teams and speaking to people. As a result, it has enriched my experiences at AAMH and given me a valuable foundation of experience that I can build on beyond UW. Congratulations, Nathan. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to say like my, I just wanted to say I'm incredibly appreciative of the philosophy department and the uh, sort of intellectual community that it's built uh, over the years. And I think for me, it's enriched my experience at UW. And like, like like uh, we'll quoted previously in the essay, um, a lot of the things I learned uh, just through serendipity just managed to build on itself and have some sort of uh, applicability outside of uh, my classes, especially when it came to reading, uh, I don't know, Schopenhauer and like the world as will and representation or uh, other works about the mind that I found really fascinating. Um, those kinds of uh, sort of uh, readings sort of enriched who I who I am as a person and really allowed me to uh, also apply like another perspective towards my other uh, organizations, especially AMH. So yeah, I mean, 
I'm looking forward to finishing up my, I'm not done with my uh, philosophy classes, which I'm really, um, and I'm like really excited to uh, uh, continue uh, next year because I'm just going to be taking, uh, finishing up the philosophy uh, degree. So yeah, thank you. Thank you again. Well, we look forward to having you and we thank you for your service across campus. Um, your work with the Alliance is, is really important. Uh, and I'm so glad that you've been able to dedicate yourself to that. So the university offers a number of competitive scholarships for students majoring in the humanities. Departments must submit nomination packets, which are then evaluated by a selection committee composed of faculty from across the campus. This year, a Herman S. and Dorothy B. Liederman Scholarship has been awarded to Jennifer Franzen. And speaking for Jennifer will be Colin Marshall. All right, thanks, Andrea. And congratulations, Jennifer. So it's, um, it's really a pleasure to, uh, to be able to publicly celebrate uh, Jennifer in this way. So I, um, and I also wanna say thanks to Jennifer for winning us an award. You know, it's another point for the philosophy department. So we owe you one. Um, I first got to know Jennifer in um, a Schopenhauer class, same Schopenhauer class that um, Nathan was in. And if you haven't read Schopenhauer, um, depends on your taste, I'm not gonna recommend it, but Schopenhauer can be a hard philosopher to engage seriously with um, for a few reasons. So one, he's uh, just kind of a bad tempered, misogynistic anti-Semite. Um, so that can throw you off. Um, he also gives this weird mix of Kant, Plato, um, and classical Indian philosophy, um, along with like bad 19th century uh, science. Um, so there's all sorts of things that can throw you off. There's some good parts too, but uh, I won't go into those. I mentioned this because what stands out to me about Jennifer's work in that class is how seriously and carefully and powerfully she engaged with Schopenhauer's philosophical system um, in that class. Uh, so this was illustrated throughout the class, but um, her final paper was really just a terrific argument on a very specific focus point, um, which is, does Schopenhauer think compassion extends to non-sentient beings? Does it extend to plants and rocks? And you might think, no one thinks you can have compassion for rocks. And one very powerful, uh, influential Schopenhauer commentator, Sandy Shapshe, has a book saying, yeah, don't worry, Schopenhauer doesn't think you have compassion for rocks and plants. And Jennifer crafted a extremely textually and philosophically powerful essay arguing, um, yes, in fact, Schopenhauer's committed to it. He says it, if you read it carefully enough. Um, and once you think about this in the right way, you think of the right sort of examples of like what's wrong with mass deforestation um, and you sort through some of the details, this position carefully understood actually isn't totally absurd. Um, it, was, it was a terrific essay and talking about Jennifer with other faculty, I've heard um, similar things about her, her skills as a historian of philosophy and a philosopher. So I wanted to read just a couple of quotes from a couple of her other instructors. Um, uh, so Paul Franco um, says uh, that Jennifer's use, uh, what stands out in her writing is a number of skills, her use of detailed and relevant examples to make abstract philosophical topics more concrete. It was like, yes, exactly. Deforestation and like compassion for nonsense, like it's exactly what Jennifer does. Um, the charitable and accurate way she reconstructs and engages the arguments of other philosophers. It's like, yes, even Schopenhauer. She even can, can charitably engage with Schopenhauer. Um, Paul says, all these skills are important to doing philosophy well, and Jennifer is already close to mastering them. Uh, Charles Ives says, the thing that stands out most about Jennifer's thinking is its succinctness and subtlety. Jennifer always seems to be able to get to the heart of the matter and in an amazing, why didn't I think of that sort of way? The elegance of her argumentation gives off a self-evident flavor that makes the complexities of reality feel ever so simple and manageable. This, of course, is something I strive for but rarely achieve. Jennifer, on the contrary, seems to come by it quite naturally. I feel similarly to Charles here. Um, so we're just delighted to have Jennifer in the department. We're really looking forward to seeing where her future studies uh, take her. And um, we're grateful for scoring us another award. So like I said, Jennifer, uh, congratulations. We owe you one. Uh, th thank you, Colin. Um, and, and I'm really, really thankful to the department too for being so supportive and all the great faculty. And I've really enjoyed my, my time here so far. And I look forward to one more year of philosophy classes. Thank you. Congratulations, Jennifer. Each spring, the University of Washington awards the College of Arts and Sciences Dean's Medal 
to the top graduating senior in each division. This award is the highest academic honor the university offers for graduating students. We're happy to acknowledge Kelsey Kenoshita as a nominee from our department for this year. And this time speaking for Kelsey is Ian Schnee. Okay, hi there, everybody. You already heard uh, what an amazing student Kelsey is. After all, how else could you be nominated for the Dean's Medal? She earned uh, perfect marks in both of the classes that she took with me. And I'll note, even if a student is highly accomplished, they can still be selfish or miserly with their philosophical wisdom. And we've all seen philosophy done as an individual enterprise where students are just in competition with others, maybe their peers, maybe even their instructors or the philosophers that they're reading in class. And Kelsey stands out in my mind for really being the paragon of the opposite ideal. From collaborating with her peers every single day in quiz section, helping other students who are struggling after class, engaging with me in dialogue uh, in the hallway or in office hours every week, Kelsey demonstrated an amazing passion for understanding everything in these courses. Even first order logic formal proofs. And on the other end of the spectrum, Diane's existential criticisms of Bojack Horseman. Kelsey can do all of it. And Kelsey's approach to philosophy was really not just uh, practiced by her, but it was articulated in an amazing way in the final paper she wrote for the existentialism and film class. So in that paper, she first explains how Kierkegaard's view of life-defining commitments has this problem where it can distance us from others. And Kierkegaard thinks we have this absurd commitment giving infinite significance to something contingent and finite. And that makes it the case that we can't communicate what's the most important thing in our lives to other people around us. So what Kelsey did, she drew on the work of Dostoevsky and Simone de Beauvoir and argued that even if Kierkegaard's right that there are ineffable parts of our experiences and our greatest passions, it's still more noble to attempt to communicate those with others and to construct meaning with the other people in our, in our lives rather than accept this fate of isolated struggle. Uh, and that's exactly what Kelsey did in the classroom every single day. And I find that completely inspiring. So uh, I'll say this, Kelsey doesn't just know how to do philosophy well, she knows how to live well with the people around her. Uh, and she is completely deserving of this award. So congratulations, Kelsey. Thank you. This is a really big honor. So I'm very grateful to be nominated. And thank you, Ian. I did enjoy our Bojack Horseman analysis of existentialism. So thank you guys. So we don't know the outcome yet, uh, but we just want you to know, Kelsey, that we are rooting for you. And uh, we will know in a few weeks who the Dean's Medal medalists will be. I have one other undergraduate initiative that I'd like to recognize. We only received the news this morning, so we don't have a slide for it. The Philosophy Society, a student-led organization, has been awarded a Husky Seed Grant to start an undergraduate journal devoted to philosophy. The university has never had an undergraduate philosophy journal, and we want to celebrate this grant, which will help the students bring their vision to life. I will also say, given what we've seen over the last 45 minutes, it's very clear that we have a plethora of excellent essays being written on the campus. And so I can't imagine a, a better uh, creation uh, than an undergraduate journal that will help us uh, raise the visibility of that work. So I, I wanna thank uh, the Philosophy Society for uh, putting together this proposal and, and the philosophy department looks forward to supporting them to watch this journal be born uh, and for our undergraduates to have a great place to publish their work. This winter, the Department of Philosophy held its second annual undergraduate video contest, asking students to create short videos on the theme, why do we need philosophy now? Why is it important to study in this moment? Running less than two minutes, the students' videos examined why philosophy is relevant during this period of relative isolation and social strife. They explored how philosophy can be used in our relationships, 
how it helps define one's stance on social issues, and how it facilitates finding common ground. The videos were judged based on relevance, creativity, storytelling, and production. Once again, prizes were made possible by generous gifts to the Friends of Philosophy Fund. First prize went to Camille Miller. Second prize to Kirby Keel. Third prize was awarded to two individuals, Pranav Prabhakar and Townsend Rowland. We're showing the winning entry from Camille Miller now, and we're going to invite you to view the other three winning entries at the end of our ceremony. But we'll start with Camille. From its roots in first millennium BC Hinduism, philosophy has evolved with influence from Aristotle, the father of logic, to the transformative studies of enlightenment age philosophers to contemporary philosophers centered on socio-political movements. Philosophy encourages us to consider the deeper function of the world and society as a whole. Science, literature, and history provide the who, what, when, where, and how. But philosophy is where we seek to discover the why. But why do you need philosophy. Now, more than ever, an understanding of logic, critical thinking, and moral framework is crucial to societal progress. We live in a world where we are constantly bombarded with sensationalized information and complex arguments are condensed into 280 characters. It is a world where the shock value of a statement holds more value than the truth. How can we navigate this jumble of facts and fiction? For this, we have to look back to Aristotle. Beyond morality and ethics, philosophy also teaches us how to craft arguments with validity and how to recognize those without. If you want to make your voice heard, it is important to know what will make others listen. Rather than resorting to polarizing buzzwords in order to spread our messages, we can instead learn from philosophy how to convince, connect, and cooperate as we forge a path through these unprecedented times to create an environment of reasonable discussion and mutual understanding. One of the things I especially appreciate about the student videos before we move on is just that um, it gives our students a chance to have their own voice in this conversation. Uh, it's nice to hear their way of presenting philosophy to the world and speaking about its relevance. Uh, they do a terrific job of it. And I think you'll enjoy the other videos uh, later in the ceremony. Now we wanna to turn to our graduate student awards. Every year, the philosophy department awards our department teaching award to a PhD student who has demonstrated excellence in teaching and dedication to the department's teaching mission. All advanced graduate students submit a yearly portfolio of their teaching accomplishments, and the teaching award is determined by a committee that reviews these portfolios. This year's recipient is Michael Ball Blakely, and speaking for Michael is Colin Marshall. All right, congratulations, Michael. It's a pleasure to embarrass you in public a little bit. I know that uh, this kind of phrase makes you slightly uncomfortable, so I've been looking forward to this. Um, so we have a lot of great teachers in the department. And um, the thing that stood, us, stood out to us about Michael's teaching portfolio this year, um, one was just the amount of teaching he's done. He's taught 12 solo courses, 12 solo courses already, and, and TA like 14. So he's done a ton of teaching and he's clearly, um, been learning and developing things through it. So what stood out to me was that Michael has a really bird's eye view of teaching. Um, so um, on really all levels. So he thinks about when students see a syllabus, like what message does that send them? Um, does it, is it like an invitation to the course or is it like a wall of texts and requirements that scares them away? He thinks about how does his presentation of himself in the class impact students' ability to engage. Um, so he deliberately doesn't come across as a um, fancy uh, high intellectual that everyone has to rise up to the level. He, he talks about his own experience showing students a way that they can enter into philosophy using the distinctive parts of their background. Um, and this is something that clearly pays off. Um, in his online classes, for example, the students had all sorts of ways of engaging. Um, Michael understood that 
it's important to participate in a philosophy class, but especially over Zoom, it's very hard for different students to do it. So he gave them a, a variety of ways um, to get participation credit. Here, I had to write it down. This is such a, a good idea, right? So to satisfy participation credits for the class, they could talk in class or post on discussion boards or come to office hours um, uh, or email him. Right, so all these different ways that students with different comfort levels and different challenges could, could engage with him and they all counted as ways of participating. I mean, that way of flexibility, I think reflects a real deep empathy for students and a real understanding of the range of places that they're coming from. Okay, so uh, um, I'm also gonna embarrass him by reading a couple of things. So one is by uh, Bill Talbot, who Michael is TA for and who was observed as teaching. Um, uh, and Bill says, Michael's students love him. This is no exaggeration. In one class, they baked him a birthday cake. Uh, side note, Mike's students have never baked me a birthday cake, um, and I've been at this longer than Michael, so yeah. Um, part, going back to Bill's quote, part of the reason is that he makes his classes personal. For example, he calls himself a hillbilly. In his section, he's open with students about his very different background, and they respond very positively to his openness. Um, here's a comment from a student that I think reflects the impact of this. I thought this class did a really great job of teaching students how to think about problems in society and develop the skills necessary to think independently after the course is over. The teacher made the class discussions open for students to talk about their own opinions without the fear of being immediately shut down if it wasn't what the instructor or the majority of students believed. A great sense of comfort and safety in discussing sensitive topics covered in this course. Um, so we're proud to have Michael in the department and I think we look forward to learning more about pedagogy and philosophy with him. Congratulations again. Well, thank you all very much. And I have enjoyed being able to learn how to teach uh, from such great instructors here. And I will note the cake was a little bit uh, horrifying as well because it was a cake of my socks, which was then making fun of me for losing my shoes before teaching one day and having to walk there wearing Ziploc bags over my feet in the rain. Uh, so there was a little bit of a subtle dig. Uh, well, thank you. Congratulations, Michael. And thank you for all your teaching in the department. The Melvin Rader Summer Stipend funds gra philosophy graduate students to pursue and develop novel projects in philosophy as a way to extend their scholarship, teaching, and or professional development. This year's recipient for work to develop an international database of information regarding admissions to philosophy graduate programs is Lindsay Whitaker. And speaking for Lindsay is Michael Blake. Hi, well, this is a um, really, welcome opportunity to uh, talk about Lynn's, who's been um, just an extraordinary member of the department in a variety of ways. But one of the things that I like about this combination of person and fellowship is that the fellowship is designed to uh, incentivize and reward innovation in philosophy and what it can do. And it also remembers Melvin Rader, who had an enormous commitment to diversity, but also economic justice and the revolutionary power of philosophy. And, and Linz represents a combination of those, as well as more unusually, a genuinely, I think, unnatural talent for organization. I, I don't know anyone who is this good at organizing things and doing philosophy and creating a genuinely inclusive pedagogical community. And I think all of these aspects of Linz's uh, self are, are brought together in this project, which is designed to really remove the veil of secrecy and insider craft knowledge from the application process. I remember when I was in the you know, middle 12th century applying to grad schools, I actually applied to some that didn't have doctoral programs because I had no idea what the hell I was doing. I didn't go to one of the elite undergrads where people are, are, are given the opportunity to really get the insider track. And things have gotten better, but they've gotten better because of people like Linz, whose work has actually created this site already that has been of use to so many prospective grad students in explaining who is doing what, how many people have applied where, and what the process really looks like. And I think the benefits for this are first off that it creates a lot of more equality among prospective grad students, which rebounds to the benefit of the field itself. But also it provides information for those of us who care about graduate students and inclusion and diversity by giving us advice as to how to avoid being, um, I'm trying to find a more politically correct word, but I can't find one, um, uh, unpleasant humans uh, in the process of admissions. 
we're a better field and a better department because of the work that Linz is doing. So I cannot imagine a better candidate for this uh, award. And I'm grateful to them for everything that they've done for this field. And I should note more personally for me as a teacher. So uh, is Linz, if, if, if yes, I, I, I want to hear their embarrassed rejoinder, so. I think so. Say, I am here though. Apparently my internet is now cutting out right of course as this comes up. So in the event that you can hear me, uh, many thanks for the department for some context. There is the link to all of it. It's gonna be migrating over to a website to add to elements of accessibility. And then also a number of programs will be getting FOIA requests for me because there's still elements that we need to improve on and some things that we need to fix. But hopefully this will be able to help us continue to make at least admissions a little bit more transparent and more accessible for the folks that will be applying in the future. We're looking forward to it, Lindsay. Thank you. The GOMAP Dissertation Fellowship is a highly competitive award from the graduate schools Graduate Opportunities and Minority Achievement Program. It's awarded to graduate students who demonstrate academic merit, are on track to complete their doctorate in the next academic year, and whose graduate academic pursuits will contribute significantly to the intellectual and cultural enrichment of future scholarship and research. One of this year's recipients, unsurprisingly to us, is Paul Tubig. And speaking for Paul is Sarah Gearing. Okay, well, if the scholarship is there to help a person finish his dissertation, it worked. Um, yep, this is a great uh, honor and Paul is so very deserving for all of the work as we all know that he's done around our department and beyond. Um, but those are all things that take up a lot of time. And so the GOMAP dissertation really allowed Paul to focus in this year and he has written amazing chapters so far. It's a dissertation on disability health justice. So he's starting from a position, if we agree with a mere difference view of disability, what happens to uh, obligations to provide health care when a person acquires a disability? And this, I'll just say, is a problem that Elizabeth Barnes herself thinks is of the utmost importance and wanted to be working on. And Paul may just get there before she does uh, with finishing his dissertation not yet, but this summer, um, we have a plan in place and he has a tenure track job to go to at Georgia Southern University. So it's a huge success story. I'm so happy for Paul. I've learned so very much from him and I'm hoping that he will stay connected with our department because I don't know what we're gonna do without Paul's infectious booming laugh uh, for all of us, whether we hear it by Zoom or uh, in the hallways through Savory and also for anyone who has heard it in the last week, his hilarious dog stories. If you don't know them, you can ask now. Congratulations, Paul. Thank you, Sarah, for the, for the really warm words. And uh, also just wanna say uh, thank you for the philosophy department. Um, again, I can't, um, this has been, even though I still need to finish my dissertation, um, I'm already thinking about post um, UW and I will miss the department immensely and what I'll miss most of all are the people. Um, so thank you all again. Congratulations, Paul. The University of Washington is home to the Simpson Center for the Humanities, one of the most active and innovative centers for humanities research in the country. The Simpson Center funds a variety of research, collaborative ventures, public scholarship, community outreach, and curricular development. Two of our students, Anna Bates and Paul Tubig, have been funded for their groundbreaking work to develop a philosophy course that will bring incarcerated individuals and UW students together to study philosophical work related to punishment and imprisonment. And once again, speaking is Sarah Gearing. So you just can't beat this duo of Anna and Paul, they have been doing amazing work with help from the Simpson Center for the last several years. They have taught intro to philosophy at the Washington um, 
Correctional Center for Women, the WCCW. They have run an ethics bowl, helped uh, bring that ethics bowl team from WCCW out to the regional ethics bowl competition, um, run a seminar with the, the group there. And now they are um, putting together a workshop between UW students and WCCW students on the theme of respect across differences in community and as I understand it, and if I don't understand it, I swear it's COVID and that the fact that they have had so many of these awards, um, it's going to be uh, developing a multimedia project, which will help report out from those experiences of the WCCW students, whether it's through a documentary or a podcast or essays or something along those lines. But I cannot wait to see the product and they have done amazing work and I hope this project continues. Congratulations to both of you. Oh, thank you very much, Sarah. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. This project is one of the examples and there are many others uh, of the ways that our graduate students are pushing us um, to be the best department we can be. They're often on the cutting edge of developing ways in which we can extend our impact uh, and think seriously about how to make philosophy important in the world that we live in today. So I thank them for that. And then I've got another great example of this. The Federation of State Humanities Councils is the umbrella organization that includes the US state and jurisdictional humanities councils. The Federation's mission is to help the State Humanities Council strengthen the civic, cultural, and social fabric of society by fostering understanding and promoting an engaged citizenry. The Federation awarded two Swartz Prizes to State Humanities Councils for outstanding humanities public programming in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Dustin Addington's work with Humanities Washington on cabin fever questions won this national competition. The judges praised the program's simple, clear, and deeply reflective and engaging content and held it up as an exemplar that charted the course for all state councils as they sought meaningful ways to address the pandemic and serve con constituents. Our departments always valued Dustin's publicly engaged philosophy work we are so pleased to see that others also recognize its value and impact. Congratulations, Dustin. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, just quick thanks to my entire dissertation committee um, and the philosophy department uh, for their support for this very non-traditional career path. So thank you for, for that. Uh, I also wanna thank my colleagues at Humanities Washington who are the sort of co-designers of this program uh, David Haldeman and George Abeta. So yeah, thanks everyone. Great. Thank you, Dustin. And I will say, uh, as Carol has probably told you, she was very sorry that she couldn't be here today. Our department is lucky to be the home of the UW Neuroethics team, an interdisciplinary group of faculty and students working to grapple with the complicated ethical issues that accompany the development of sophisticated neural technologies many of which are being developed right here on the UW campus by the Center for Neural Technology. This group has been recognized for outstanding poster presentation at the International Neuroethics Society Conference. Speaking for this award will be the team's fearsome leader, faculty member Sarah Gearing. Wow, fearsome. Uh, I, I just want to say congratulations to this team. This is the team that uh, has been working on an NIH grant on agency and brain computer interfaces, and particularly to Andrea Chernow, who's our wonderful, one of our wonderful postdocs. Um, just a quick and funny story these days when you do posters at um, conferences, not only do you have to create the poster, but you have to visual or you have to offer an audio narration through the poster and a video that accompanies it. So Andreas has learned many, many skills and is much better than any of us at doing this kind of thing at this point. And it showed because he, with the poster that presented the work from the grant, uh, won this prize this year. And I just want to also add that when Ishan and Andreas took an initial uh, attempt 
at a uh, visual image, <laughs> not just for the poster, but for our general project to one of the um, library design consultants. I believe what they said was something along the lines of, it kind of has a Microsoft 2000 vibe, which was not a compliment. Um, and from that, there was a lot of work and revision into a really striking image that I think is a, a big part of why this poster won. And it's now in a publication. So huge congratulations to the whole group. Congratulations, everybody. So today is primarily about celebrating our students, but we also like to recognize some noteworthy accomplishments by department faculty. And I will say that um, by now you will understand why I think this is one of my favorite events of the year. We learn about all these amazing students and we also learn about the dedication of the faculty to those students through the stories they tell, the words that they offer in praise uh, of their students. So um, at this stage, I'm always feeling a bit overwhelmed uh, with gratitude, both for my colleagues and for the terrific students uh, that we have an opportunity to teach. I do want to mention uh, a few things uh, related to our faculty. First, I want to recognize uh, the three uh, promotions that we have had in the department this year. I'm extremely pleased to announce that Paul Franco has been promoted to associate teaching professor, that Ben Feinzeig and Karina Fouri have been promoted to associate professor with tenure here at the University of Washington. We look forward to many, many years uh, of uh, companionship and um, great philosophy with all three of them. Um, I'll say just a couple things uh, for those of you who, who don't know about these uh, faculty members. Um, ben Feinzeig works primarily in philosophy of physics, uh, in particular algebraic quantum field theories. He has also led uh, a team of undergraduate students uh, in relation to the experimental math lab uh, in the math department. And uh, his work has been recognized now with two very large NSF grants. Ben has been uh, a terrific addition to our department. Karina Fouri works in political philosophy and public health ethics. And the value of the work that Karina undertakes um, has been underscored time and again over the past year. Karina has work related to um, equitable healthcare distribution. She's done groundbreaking work in relation to moral distress of caregivers. And I will say that Karina has done uh, this work in the past year uh, with a very young child on her lap most of the time. Uh, so uh, we're so happy to see her reach this milestone as well. And finally, there's Paul Franco. Paul teaches more broadly than any member of this department, and he's done it for years. You've got a course, Paul will teach it. It is amazing the breadth of knowledge that Paul has, uh, has shared with us over the years. And as a result, um, he's a bit of a Pied Piper among the undergraduates, I think. There are so many students who come to philosophy through a first course with Paul and effectively never leave because of uh, the great skill that he brings to his teaching, but also the empathy and the support. He's an incredible mentor to many, many of our students. Um, and in addition to that, has his own research trajectories. So he works in history of philosophy and also in philosophy of science, especially science and values. Um, all three of these faculty are just incredibly valuable to our department. And so we're so happy to be able to see them be promoted. Next, we have the Robinson fam. Uh, yes, actually, we should clap for these folks. Take a second. It's a big milestone, of course.
And have we, let's see, have we moved through, Kate, have we moved through? I think we should move through a couple slides. Okay, make sure we got through. Okay, now we come to, oh no, we were, we were at right. Sorry, that was my problem. Um, the Robinson Family Faculty Initiative Grants um, are funded by a generous donor uh, who continues to study philosophy. These funds allow faculty to undertake work that might not otherwise be possible because of limitations of financial resources or faculty time. And the grant this year is awarded to Ben Feinzeig for a conference workshop that he'll be leading at Friday Harbor Labs uh, next year in, related, in relation to his research work. This will allow him to bring together um, experts in the field uh, from across the country. And, uh, and we're so happy that, the, uh, that these grants are able to facilitate that work. Next, we want to announce the next winner of the Gerler Faculty Fellowship. The Dan Gerler Faculty Fellowship is an award that allows a faculty member in the department to have um, time to complete an intensive research project. It means that over a two year period, uh, they are given research support, both in terms of release from some of their other obligations uh, and in terms of financial support in order to undertake a project that might not be possible otherwise. So it's, um, it is a deep investment in the research potential of our faculty. And I, I thank uh, Dan Gerler for his support for these fellowships. Our next recipient of the Gerler Fellowship is Colin Marshall. Colin is going to be undertaking a book project in relation to the work that he's been doing over now the last several years, thinking about the nature of respectful persuasion. And uh, this is something that started for Colin as uh, a project uh, related to an undergraduate course that he just started teaching uh, this fall, 118, uh, which helps undergraduates think about uh, what respectful and effective persuasion would look like and in doing this, Colin brings to bear a wide variety of empirical research from psychology and couples it with uh, conceptions of persuasion that we get from philosophy while also um, acknowledging um, in a rich sense, the moral and ethical issues that surround attempts uh, to persuade others. This is something that I think Colin engaged with in part because of watching the social and political dynamics uh, in the United States over the last uh, few years. And so it is a project really um, aimed at having genuine impact on the world around us. It's wonderful that now Colin is going to be undertaking uh, a scholarly book project uh, in relation to this work and two uh, workshops uh, in addition to develop this work in a way that will extend its reach well outside the classrooms uh, that uh, where this work is, is starting here at UW. So the students uh, are, are getting the first version um, and Colin will continue to develop this work. So congratulations, Colin, and we look forward uh, to seeing the book uh, develop over the next couple of years. Thanks so much, Andrea. Now I have to write it, which is, a bummer, now you but, do have yeah. to write it. We're looking forward to it. Finally, we have uh, the UW Simpson Center. We've already talked about the Simpson Center has awarded uh, summer fellowships for new graduate seminars in the humanities. And this year, Michael Blake and Sarah Gearing have been awarded uh, a fellowship for their development of the graduate ethics certificate course series to incorporate uh, more significant elements of public scholarship. And the graduate certificate is something that uh, has been um, run through the program on ethics for a number of years. Uh, and I appreciate that Sarah and Michael are going to take some time and think about how to make that uh, certificate program and the coursework even more effective than it already is. Uh, and I appreciate the Simpson Center helping to support that work. So congratulations. Uh, Michael and Sarah. Thank you.
And the, the joy is that we get to work with Paul and Anna too. Yeah. That's great. Okay. So we are at the formal end uh, to our program, but in closing, I would uh, like to offer a few words of thanks um, because we've been through a difficult year and we've been through um, a unique uh, set of challenges in relation to that. Um, so I want to thank the faculty. I wanna thank them for teaching in their bathrooms, for teaching with an infant in their arms or for two elementary school kids lurking just out of the Zoom frame. I wanna thank them for writing letters of recommendation to help get recognition for the excellent work our students do, both undergraduate and graduate. I wanna thank the graduate students for being the first line of contact to our undergraduates, many of whom were trying to salvage their college experience while facing a diverse set of challenges, for giving students the compassion and energy to keep going and stay engaged, even when they themselves were at times struggling. I wanna thank the many folks in the department who have been pushing us to think about how to make our community better, more supportive, more inclusive, more equitable. I wanna thank the staff as I started this meeting, uh, uh, told you for holding us all together through everything and being nimble in the face of a constantly changing landscape. I wanna thank the undergraduates for hanging in there, for not being drawn down by the fact that you got a year that's very different than the one you planned for, for still coming to class, for giving faculty reasons to say to me, as I've heard multiple times in meetings over the years, uh, over this past year, wow, that was one of the best conversations I've ever had in a class, right? Those are things that somehow you all were able to materialize through a screen like this. It's been a hard year, more than a bit of a slog, and I thank each of you for your part in keeping the boat afloat. I think it's especially fitting to say this at this particular meeting, at the award ceremony that focuses on our students, because there's nothing better than being in a classroom with a set of students really digging into the material, bringing their whole selves to the task and feeling comfortable to share. These are golden moments, even in the midst of a pandemic, even in the midst of political turmoil. So it's been a hard year, but really our students, like the excellence that you have seen exhibited for the last hour and a half, that's what has kept us all going. And so um, I thank you to the undergrads and the graduate students who are here today. Um, you give meaning to what we do. You're why we do what we do. And I'm so happy to be able to celebrate you. And I'm just sorry that we are not all together in person, but we are certainly together and with you in spirit. So now I'm going to let the undergraduates finish the evening. So we will close the formal part, but I invite you um, to uh, go grab yourself a glass of wine or just sit back and we're going to view the other three winning videos from the undergraduate video contest. Thanks everybody for joining us. Special thanks for the parents who also got a final year, uh, many of you, that, were, that was quite different than what you expected. Um, we're glad that you were able to be part of philosophy department community for this brief period of time this afternoon. So take care, everybody. I look forward to seeing you all in person very soon.